Broker course is broken up into four parts. So part three, we're going to start with broker cram session part three, chapters 10 through 14 is all about listing and selling real estate. So anything involving real estate contracts, brokerage relationships, uh, financing of real estate, closing statements. This is where all this stuff comes out. Now we'll, we'll briefly go over the closing statement and then when we get to the end, we'll do a sample question on the board. That way it makes it easier. We'll probably do that after we go ahead and do the specialties because that way we can get all done and do the math last. Otherwise we're gonna be bored. So chapter 10, page 263. Uh, brokerage relationships and disclosures is chapter four in the pre-licensing course, chapter 10 in the broker course. One of my favorite chapters, right? So one of the main things I want to talk about is when we do uh, the model of agency that when you're tested, you're only going to see the terms customer and principal. You're not going to see client or anything else. So principal is fiduciary, principal is single agency. So remember that, right? So law of agency, obviously we're agents, we're agents, we're acting on behalf of somebody else. That's what an agent is, right? Uh, they don't really talk a lot about general agents and special agents and all that. So brokers are special agents and general agents work for the broker. Broker, if you see those two things on a broker exam, that's what they mean. Um, normally they're on the sales associate exam, not on the broker exam. If it doesn't talk anything about special agent, or if it does talk about special agent and the end, they're asking what a broker is, that's the answer for that one. So you don't want to make, you want to make sure that you understand special agent is in that. It's like an analogy with broker. Um, so what are the brokerage relationships in Florida? We have three brokerage relationships, right? We have three, we have transaction broker, we have single agency, and we have no brokerage relationship, right? And then there's a fourth one called designated sales associate, which we'll go over in a second. It's basically a legal form of dual agency, right? So we're gonna talk about agency, and we're gonna put TV, uh, SA and, and R, right? These are the one, and then designated sales associate, DSA. So in 2008, they passed a law that said everybody is presumed to be a transaction broker unless otherwise disclosed, right? So you don't have to do a disclosure if you're a transaction broker, right? We can, again, be no broker's relationship or single agency as well. The thing is, is we have to have certain duties that go along with each one, right? So if you are a single agent, you have to provide disclosure before or at the time of entering into a listing agreement or before showing the property, whichever is first, right? These are, this is when we provide the single agency require, uh, notice. Again, transaction broker, we don't have to do a notice. And then non-representation, we have to disclose before showing property, typically on a for sale by owner. A lot of times we would do a no broker relationship with the seller and we would have some type of transaction broker or buyer agreement with the buyer, right? Not only are we gonna get this non-representation agreement signed by the seller, but we're also gonna get a compensation agreement assigned so that we make sure that we're getting paid for the services we're providing because the seller's the one paying the commission typically. Unless you have a buyer brokerage agreement, then the buyer will be paying that piece, right? So exceptions to disclosure requirements, again, what friends of the transaction broker, right? So if we have no brokerage relationship, we don't have any other duties besides the core three that are required. No brokerage relationship, we have what three duties? The acronym is ADD. And is account for all funds. So if somebody gives you a deposit, you have to account for funds in a timely manner, in a proper manner, right? We have to disclose all material facts, all defects, the property that are not readily observable. What that means is if there's a roof leak and you see the water dripping down, we don't have to disclose it because they can see it, right? But if we see a rain on the roof and somebody doesn't know what that means, we need to disclose that there possibly could be a roof leak, we need to get a further inspection, right? It's only material defects that are not readily observable. You see a hole in the wall, you don't need a skirt. <laughs> Say, hey, there's a hole in the wall, right? 
Uh, we don't disclose what though? We don't disclose if somebody died in the property, we don't disclose if it's haunted, we don't disclose if there's somebody with HIV AIDS, right? We don't have to disclose any of that and we probably shouldn't disclose that because it could hurt one or both parties, right? The other thing we have to do, even if we're in a broker, we have to do, we have to deal with the public honestly and fairly. Right? Those are the three items that every relationship has to have. Now, no broker has to have ADD, account for all funds, disclose all material facts that are not readily observable, and deal honestly and fairly. Then we have this thing called single agency. Single agency has to do with a fiduciary relationship, and I like to say it's basically the agent being married to the buyer, right? Whatever you do, I do. If you jump, or if I tell you to jump, you ask me how high, we jump. Right, we do it together. You jump off a bridge, we jump off a bridge. You're responsible for the client's actions. I'm responsible for client's actions. Sorry, client's responsible for the agent's actions. It could get you in a legal situation that you don't want to be in. And there's also a couple more things that has to happen, right? There's a couple more things. The, the big one is there's four major responsibilities but there's six total, six total because there's two there for transaction broker and for single agency, right? So single agent is what? Add cold. Add, well yeah, it's actually add up cold. So we'll talk about up first because up is gonna be with transaction broker as well. Up is use skill, care, and diligence, and present all offers timely. Okay, those are the two things. That's what up stands for. Cold is confidentiality, obedience, loyalty, and full disclosure or disclosure in full. So if you remember that, these are the ones, right, that are going to be for a fiduciary relationship. And then we got transaction broker which is what? Add up. It's app, um, but what you're gonna see is the second P isn't ever tested, okay? The second P is never tested. Add up, app is count for funds, disclose all material facts, deal honestly and fairly with the public, use skill, care, and diligence, present all offers timely, exercise limited confidentiality, so transaction broker is limited confidentiality, and the difference between that and full confidentiality is that you can speak on behalf of the seller in a loyal relationship as a single agent, but you can't speak on behalf of the seller in a transaction broker relationship, meaning you can't make decisions for them and talk for them. If they tell you, then you can speak for them, right? The last P is perform additional duties as agreed upon, right? Well, you're gonna perform additional duties no matter what you do, if you agree to do it, right? Good, so far? Mm -hmm. okay. So, single agency has to do with the actual brokerage. So if you work for a single agency brokerage and another agent has to sell the or wants to bring a buyer, then we have to do this form. What is this form called? Transition. Consent to transition. So there's two things that can happen here. We can either have both parties consent to transition to transaction broker prior to showing the property, or the buyer can sign a no representation agreement. Well, the buyer is probably not going to sign a representation agreement, so we need to get the seller and the buyer to agree to a no brokerage relation, or I'm sorry, a transition transaction broker has to be shown prior to showing the property because if you're working for the same broker, it's still considered dual agency if you're showing the house and you're listing it. So the benefit, there's no benefit to being a single agent if you're trying to do what they call a birthday sale because you're gonna to have to transition and you're gonna to have to do additional paperwork. You're gonna to have to do extra paperwork in the beginning as well. What I would say is 
if you're acting as a single agent, let's sign the consent to transition at the time of listing. That way, if you run into that situation, you can continue to show the property, right? That's the transition piece. So if, I, if I'm a single agent and I have a listing, are the agents in my office allowed to show that property? Only if they do the consist, consistent That's what I'm transition. Saying. So if I'm with ABC and are all of our offices a single single um, agency. agency, no one in my office can show it until... Until you get that signed by the buyer. If you have it signed by the seller listing, then uh -huh. you might have to get it signed by the buyer. You don't? You do. Oh, okay. You do. So regardless... Okay. Both sides have to have the consent to transition because you can't be a single agent for one and not the other. Okay. Right. No, that's fine. So I was just okay. The only time you're allowed to have single agency is this thing called I mean, I'm sorry. The only time you can have dual agency in the state of Florida, in this case, a broker would act as an intermediary and the agents that are assigned would be single agents, would be for a designated sales associate. And what do we what do we associate what do we associate with designated sales associate? $1 million in assets. Mm -hmm. Both parties, buyer and seller, has to have at least a $1 million in documented assets to be assigned a buyer's agent and a seller's agent that are both single agents in a transaction called a designated sales associate, which is legal. It's the only legal dual agency in Florida, and the broker acts as Switzerland. It acts as the intermediary. How do we terminate a broker's relationship? If we have all this stuff going on, how do we terminate this relationship? Well, we can terminate it a bunch of different ways, right? We can fulfill the contract and finish out the job that terminates it, right? If the broker dies, if the seller dies, if we withdraw it, if we have a mutual agreement to terminate, all these are ways that you can do it. Destruction of property, bankruptcy, right? the property burns down, the agency relationship's gone, right? Because they can't sell a house anymore, right? Those are the most important things. And, and again, we're talking about for this, it's residential sales. So you may get a question saying, we have a commercial property and they didn't disclose, is that okay? Yes, because commercial property doesn't fall under that. We're talking about residential. What is a residential sale? It's one to four units, right? It's vacant land zone one to four units, or it's agricultural property less than 10 acres. That's what a residential sale is. So condo units, any of the stuff that's single family stuff, we can we have to do these disclosures. That's pretty much it in a nutshell for our brokerage relationships and disclosures. This is heavily tested to consent to transition uh, and the duties. Sometimes you see the duties as a negative question, which is the following, is not a duty for the single agent. Um, and they'll have limited confidentiality as the they're answer, not, yeah, that's right? Like that's not the key, yeah. All right, so that's where you gotta be careful. What I like to say for questions like this, look for two answers that contradict each other. Usually one of those is the right answer, right? If they're exact opposites, chances are one of them's the right answer. So moving on from disclosures and the law agency, we're actually going to go to contract law. We're going to talk about uh, not only contract law, time is of the essence, but title, how, it's, how we do title, what we should tell people, what we shouldn't tell people. We have listing agreements, right? We have, so there's some things about listing agreements that you need to know. Uh, open listings, so we have four types of listing agreements. We have open listings, we have exclusive agency, we have exclusive right of sale, and we have net listing agreements. I'm gonna put net over here. Right. These are the four types of listing agreements we can have. List, listing agreements can be written or oral. Um, if it's oral, it's not enforceable unless there is substantial evidence, right? So an oral agreement 
for a commission paid out and you've seen it done six times with the same people, that's good enough for a court case. But just a one-time deal, it's hard to prove, so it's pretty much not enforceable. But remember, it can be enforceable under certain situations, so you have to make sure you understand that. So can you explain the difference between the listing agreement types? No. Okay, so open listings is every broker can list this house, and whoever brings me the buyer first, first come, first serve, gets a commission. Okay. okay, usually FISBO. Right, FISBO okay. are basically open listings. Yeah. Can you put those on the MLS? No, because multiple brokers can represent you at one time, right? Then we have exclusive agency and exclusive right of sale. I'm gonna come back to those, and we have net listing. Net listing is, seller says, I wanna net $90,000. Whatever you can get above and beyond that $90,000 that I net, you can keep as your commission. Right, so you add your closing cost and your commission on there, and you get a hundred thousand dollars. And closing cost two thousand dollars, you make eight thousand dollars on a ninety thousand dollar listing. That's what a net listing is. Exclusive agency means I'm the only agency listing it, but if the seller brings a buyer, the seller keeps his money. If I bring a buyer as the agency listing person, I get paid. But if the procuring cause of sale is the owner, they get paid. They don't have to pay you. So you're listing it with the chance of not getting paid. Because how are you going to say which list? Are you going to get an exclusive list saying, I've shown the house of these people? If they show it, if they buy it, I don't have to pay you, right? That's what you got to worry about. This exclusive right of sale is one broker as well. But no matter who sells the property, you get a commission. So everybody lists in this world as an exclusive right of sale. Both of these can be entered in the MLS because it's one broker. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have to be the procuring cause, right? So it says the problem with the exclusive agency piece is that the seller may try to go around you and say that they were the procuring cause. Now you have an argument. Now you have to figure out how to work that out, right? Procuring cause is the reason you would have a lawsuit in this and this agreement, right? Right. What if you showed the property and broker B over here showed the property and you're both claiming to be the procuring cause? How do you work that out? Well, what I would do is I call broker B and say, let's just split it 50-50. Right. Yeah, but not everybody's gonna do it that way. So just understand that people are greedy, right? Now, affecting a sale for this has to do with bringing what? A ready, willing, and able buyer, right? You have to bring a ready, willing, and able buyer. If they're not ready, ready willing, and able, then you're not the one that's affecting the sale. But when they're, when they're hiring you to list the property, Essentially, that's what they're hiring you to do. Find them a ready, willing, and able buyer so that you can affect the sale. That's how you get paid. Right? And then it says here about referral fees. Where referral fees can be shared broker to broker. They cannot be shared broker to sales associate, right? So broker A can refer broker B business. Sales associate A can't get paid until broker A collects from broker B under that referral agreement. Then we have this, we have two parts of chapter 475 that pertain to commissions, right? We have the Commercial Real Estate Sales Commission Lien Act. It's part three for commercial. Basically, we're saying that we cannot lien against residential property for a commission. But for commercial, we can, as long as there is something establishing how we're getting paid, right? So it says we can lien gross sale proceeds, liens any existing liens of higher priority. So, um, and then it says that the broker's lien can be collected upon less the owner's closing costs and 
for the sale of the transaction. So that closing cost, you're gonna get paid first, right? But we can lien commercial property to get paid. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. if there's a dispute, you exercise this commission, commission notice, claiming what you owe, right? The broker has to claim within 30 days of that closing. Again, you're not gonna be really tested on that piece. What you're gonna be tested on is, chapter three is the Commercial Lien Act for commissions, right? Chapter four of chapter 475 is the Leasing Commission Lien Act. So just to go back to that, if a dispute arises over unpaid commission, the broker must execute a notarized commission notice form claiming the commission is owed. The broker must, within 30 days after the commission is earned, and at least one day before closing. And the very last sentence is, if the closing agent has dispersed funds before the broker's... Then you can't get the money. Then you can't get... So Correct. it's before closing. It's before closing. So you're you're yeah. disclosing that you have to have this, but you have to have it prior to closing, right? You have to claim on this prior to closing. I, wow. I'm owed a commission prior to closing. Yeah. Right? Because commercial deals might take two years, right? That's, yeah. So that's why they're saying you have to claim it prior. It's just like in a contract. We're, we're in a real estate contract. We claim that commission prior, right? The entry into the MLS is a promise that we're going to pay this commission, right? The listing agreement says what we're going to disperse. We're claiming that commission at the time of contract at the time of employment contract. Now with the commercial act here, it says, it says broker has earned an unpaid leasing commission can file a lien notice within 90 days after the tenant takes possession of the property. So in, the, in that case, you can actually claim after the occupancy, right? And then it says a renewal commission is an additional commission under the brokerage agreement earned by when a lease is subject to the brokerage agreement is later renewed. So if you have a lease and then it's renewed, you can claim an additional commission. So that says, right? All you really need to know is part three has to do with commercial sales. Part four has to do with commercial Lease. rentals, okay. right? That's what you really need to know. They're not going to ask you a bunch of detail about it because it's not covered that much. Um, then there's a buyer broker agreement. Buyer broker agreement says in the event that the seller doesn't pay a full commission that the buyers, the, uh, the buyer can pay the additional up to whatever percent you decide. So if, if you were charging three and a half percent as a buyer's agent and the seller was only paying two and a half percent, the buyer would come up with the additional one percent, right? So it's just an employment agreement. I don't like buyer broker agreements. It also protects you for a certain time period. It's almost like you're getting a retainer and you're collecting um, commission no matter what. So if you have a buyer broker agreement signed and I show the property, I don't get paid. If you, if you, because you're the procuring cost, because you have something in writing saying that we hired you, right? Um, so if I write that deal, you would still get paid. Now, I'm gonna tell you this, even though that's the case, I'm gonna tell you that, that brokers will argue with you and they will fight you for part of that commission because they showed the property. So I'm gonna say, always show the property that you write an offer. Unauthorized practice of law. So we can't create documents as real estate professionals. We can't create documents, but we can use the fill in blank forms provided by the bar, right? Provided by an attorney assigned to the real estate board. We're not preparing leases, right? We're not preparing contracts. We're filling in blanks, but we're not preparing the actual contract. So some of the times people will create these crazy clauses in contracts. You can get trouble for that, right? If you put a small one in there, uh, contingent on appraisal, well, it's already written in the contract, but if you want to reinforce it, that's fine. But if you're going to sit here and write out Subject to A, B, and C, this is what's gonna happen if this happens, like that's gonna be a little bit more in, on the legal realm, that you probably shouldn't be creating these abstract clauses, right? So that's considered unauthorized practice of law. So uh, when, you know, during the COVID time, when it was like, um, you know, whatever, line two and additional terms. So we would write additional terms like, if the property does not appraise for a certain value, buyer 
uh, agrees to pay 10 to 15, 20,000 over appraised value. You can do that because we have we have an amendment, right? We have an amendment that says okay, but I said, the appraisal, okay. right? As long as there's a form that documents that, because there is a form that documents that, um, we shouldn't be writing. Well, seller agrees to lease back this for a certain period of time, and then and then provide that lease agreement. Okay. Statute of frauds. So a couple things with statute of frauds, it needs to be in writing to be enforceable, right? You can have, like I said, if you can establish a pattern with an oral document, it can be enforceable, but statute of frauds says it needs to be written, right? Um, two exceptions to statute of fraud exist. It says full performance and executed contracts. The example would be a seller who deeds a property with a handshake agreement, but once they finish the contract, once they, once they close on the new deal, that's considered executed, even though it's oral, it, 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 it could still be considered something that's enforceable because they've actually finished the transaction out, right? Partial performance, same thing here under statute of frauds. It says statute of frauds doesn't apply to partially performed contracts if two conditions have been met, right? Partial payment has been made or the buyer has taken physical possession of the property. Um, something that I like to talk about on that is constructive and actual notice. So do you remember what actual notice is versus constructive notice? Mm -hmm. So actual notice is I buy a house and I move into it. That's actual notice, okay? Constructive notice is I buy a house, I don't move into it yet, but I recorded the document. When you record it, it's constructive notice. So here's a scenario. I buy a house and you buy a house, right? You close on it on April 1st, okay? The recording happens on April 5th, okay? Four days later, because you got drunk, you fell on the steps, whatever you did, you fell asleep on the steps of the courthouse and you didn't wake up for three days and you recorded it or you moved in the house four days later, right? I come in and I buy the house from the seller and I move in on April 2nd. Whose house is it? Well, yours. It's my house because I created the actual notice, right? If, if you recorded it, even though you recorded it after the fact, I took physical possession, either one can supersede the other. Wow. So if I moved in on the 6th, but you recorded on the 5th, then you can kick me out and take possession of the house. So when it comes to actual and constructive notice... So then who has recourse against the seller? I guess either one at that point, right? No, either, I'm just asking. Either one. Okay. But because he got paid twice. Right. Exactly. So you could go back and sue him, but they probably skipped town by then. Right. Right. Yeah. I was just wondering. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's see. What else are we talking about? Our seller documents, deed, survey, mortgage. Is that something that would? That's what title insurance saves us would, from. Yeah. Okay. Uh, defects. Okay. So say he closed on our property, and then. He was like, all right, well, I'm just going to quick claim, claim deed this over to somebody, you know, but both of you are getting qu quick claim deeds. So that's what happened there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So remember, you want to try to get a general warranty deed. So there's the four deeds, right? You have general warranty deed, special warranty deed, bargain sale deed, quick claim deed, right? From best protection yeah. to least, okay. right? So, and we'll talk about those different deeds. Um, there's a couple clauses that come up as contracts all the time. So we're going to skip over to, we're talking about different types of uses and everything here. So it's weird. It says documents need to write the contract, seller documents, we have a deed, right? The deed's transferring the ownership, right? Survey is what? Showing encroachments, easements, et cetera, et cetera, something on property. What's an encroachment? Encroachment is something that's going over the line. Like over the the line. Or... It's kind of like in football. When you go over the, the line of scrimmage, you're now encroaching on the other side. You get a five-yard penalty or whatever it is, right? If you have an easement, an easement means I have access to this property for some reason. I need maybe lake access or I need utility access, whatever the case is, right? That's what an easement is. And then there's this thing called easement by prescription, which is, it's funny because there's somebody that I know right now that's trying to sell a little parcel of land. Well, it's in front of 
the beach at Fernandina and they've been walking across this property for 20 years. They can't sell that. It's going to have to be donated because it's been an easement by prescription for 30 years, mm -hmm. right? You can't just up and sell it. So donate it to the city and move on. It's only worth a thousand bucks anyway. It's not worth anything because it's such a small piece of land. So then what would private road be considered? Private road is private road. It's, it's. Okay. I didn't know it's, that it's, a, it's an the, easement in yeah. a sense because mm -hmm. but everybody has agreed on a court document and recorded that okay. saying we're able to use this as an easement right okay now. that's what i was okay yeah um let's see what else we have to zoning and zoning variances and non-conforming use right that's going to be further down towards the end so i'm not going to get into that until chapter part four let's see and then a mortgage what is a mortgage do we pay the mortgage every month no, we pay our note. We pay our promissory note every month, right? So the mortgage is the instrument used to convey collateral interest to who is, who's lending the money, right? So we sign a mortgage for the lender, and if we don't pay the note, they can foreclose on us and exercise the mortgage agreement. Real estate contracts. When we're talking about all these legal things with contracts, most of the time we're, for, we're again falling under that residential category. So a lot of times I'll ask questions, which one doesn't apply, just like agency, and they'll put owner of a condominium, owner of a one to four unit quadruplex, owner of a vacant land of 10 acres or nine acres, right? And then they'll have some commercial deal on there. Pick the one that doesn't fit. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> Horse farm, ice cream shop, you know, condo, and then whatever. Right. Yeah. So pick Tree the house, one that you doesn't have to pick fit. the right. ice cream shop because right. that's right because it's commercial. Exactly. Right. right. So then we have these these dates. Right. Time is of the essence. You hear that term? Time is of the essence. Stay within contract. Stay within contract. You hear that term? Out of contract. It's horrible. Don't ever use that term. Out of contract. You're not out of contract. Time is of the essence. I don't like it when people say out of contract. Is of the essence. Quotes. Right? Time is of the essence. What does time is of the essence mean? Time is of the essence means we have a timeline in the contract. We need to make that realistic. Don't give me a six hour window to sign an offer. Okay, that's ridiculous. I know this guy doesn't sign documents on the weekends and it's Friday. Give me till Monday to answer you, right? Don't push me because the selling agent or the listing agent is going to be the one that's running the show Dang. on the contract acceptance anyway. Just because the time expires doesn't mean that the time, the contract is void. It means it's voidable. If you get the signature after the time that's designated on a contract, you need to update that and initial it so that we're within compliance of that contract so that one or both parties can't avoid it, right? It's voidable. The term voidable means one or more parties has the right to void this without recourse. The effective date of the contract is the date when the last person signs it. So if buyer A signs it, on February 6th and buyer B signs it on February 8th and the seller signs it on February 7th, the effective date of the contract is February 8th, right? It doesn't matter if one party or the other, it matters to each individual person. If you're a sole owner of a property, it talks about owner and severalty. If you see owner and severalty, it means you're the individual owner of that property, right? So we're gonna talk about title, so the title, title things that come up are JTWROS, T by, T, T by E, TIC, Tenants in Common, right? What do these mean? So the things you need to know about Tenancy and joint tenancy and tenancy by the entireties and tenants in common is this. Tenants by entireties is a separate beast. Tenants and by, by entireties is a married couple. 
that can go back to either joint tenancy or right of survivorship or tenants in common, depending on the situation. So we'll explain JTW, ROS, and TIC first. The similarities with joint tenants and tenancy in common is that it's two or more buyers. Okay. Two or more buyers acquiring a property at the same or different times is tenants in common. Two or more buyers acquiring a property at the same time is gen joint tenants or right of, survivor, right, right of survivorship. You cannot be joint tenants if you acquire the property at different times. So if you add a third party on there and you acquire it at different times, that's tenants in common. Joint tenancy, but they're both two or more people. When a joint tenant dies, they have equal undivided interest in the property. So if a joint tenant dies and it's part of a three-person joint tenancy, each party will take half of the third party and go from 33% ownership to 50% ownership. If it's tenants in common and there's three parties and one dies, that person's stuff goes to their heirs. Their, their equity goes to their heirs. The other two parties do not get that. So it's important that we title properly based on which situation we're in. So if I'm doing a purchase with you, for example, I have two kids, you have three kids, and you want your kids to be the heirs if something were to happen, then we would have to have joint, or we would have to have tenants in common so that your kids would get an equal share of 50% ownership if something happened to you, or my kids would get an equal percent of 50% of the buyback, right? That's why people do tenants in common. Now, the more confusing one is tenants by entireties. If you get married and one of the spouses dies, Title reverts to tenants, or uh, title reverts to joint tenancy or right of survivorship. So if we're married and I die, you get the full property at 100% ownership. Okay. If we're married when we buy the property and we get divorced, it reverts to tenants in common, and then equal shares are given to the heirs. Okay. That's where it's different. Tenants by entireties is the tricky one because the question might say. A and B were married at the time of purchase, so their title is tenanted by entireties. Spouse A dies, what happens next? Are they tenants by are they still tenants by entireties? Are they tenants in common? Are they joint tenants right of survivorship? Or they'll say so something else. It goes else. to survivorship. It goes to survivorship in that case, right? But if we get divorced, it goes to whoever else. The heirs. Right, the heirs. Well, how so how does that, okay, it goes to the, the heirs and me. It would go to, yeah, correct. That's what I'm saying, correct. okay. Yeah, so but it's now tenants in common. Right. So you and have a 50% share. And they only have and 25. And they would have, or if whatever. they had two kids, there was 25, 25. Oh, uh, okay. It would still be 50%, but okay. you would get half, basically. And the way it works is your heirs, if you don't have a will, it will default to the books. And what I mean by the books is it defaults to the legal books. So parents get it first, kids get it second, then it goes outwards to sisters and uncles and whoever else, right? So, so then if you, go to, if you try to sell, the kids have to be on board? Correct. Okay. Correct. So how do we avoid that? How do we avoid that? If it's a single person that owns it in severalty and they're elderly and you don't want to go to probate, what you would do is do a life estate. Right, a life estate, but but if you do a life estate, your ownership is actually like in my name, and then my mother would get a life estate, right? She wouldn't have the right to sell it without me. However, if you get an enhanced life estate with a ladybird rider, yeah, yeah. then that person could still sell and use the property, right? So we're gonna talk about life estates, and, and if somebody talks about life estate, who is left over if somebody dies? The heirs. Your reminder man, the remainder man. No. So in a life estate, I now own the property. I'm granting 
the use of that estate until that person dies. When that person dies, it reverts back to me as a remainder person. Oh, so you're the actual owner. I'm actually owner. I messed up. Okay. Okay. I, so I that's where life estates are great for estate planning because now if someone passes away, there's no probate. It goes right back to the owner, right? So it's important to do this. Right, but then you also have state. right. So, but you have to explain to your mother or whoever who's lived in that house for fifty years. Hey, just give me the house. You get everything. It's your house until you die, and then it comes directly to me. Correct. Okay. Correct. So you have to be able. To you have to that. be able to explain it to her that you're not trying to take her over. But that's why you get the rider. You get the ladybird rider because that makes them able to sell a house while they're alive. Right, but right. the ladybird rider is that the house goes directly to you if she dies. Well, that, that's the whole life estate. Right. Ladybirds, yeah. so that they have the right to sell it yeah. without you. Without you, okay. Right. So, and then there's this escrow, escrow money deposit. Insert the amount of wording in the earnest money blank. With the regards to escrow, the thing that might be tested is this $10,000 thing, right? If the transaction, if the total amount of cash in one transaction exceeds $10,000, we have to fill out IRS form A300 because we're depositing more than $10,000, right? In cash. In cash or Not, a check. Oh, or a check. Oh. It's the amount of change. It says subject to checks collection. Here's the thing. If buyer may deposit in cash, it could also be a check. So, so if you if, have a if you have a ten thousand dollar binder, then you have to also fill out this form. Right, and and, and report it, right? Um, and that's a thing. You, well, you're, anyway, and you're, you're reporting the buyer. Yeah, correct for okay. the, for that, right? If you give it to a title agent, they have to deal with it. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Though. Okay. Right. So. Buyer deposits can be checks, can be cash, can be cashier checks, can be money orders, it can be whatever you want to provide, right? So um, you can also have this earnest money in deposit. You can have it in separate installments, right? You can take 5,000 now and 5,000 later. Well, that's still $10,000. We still have to report that, right? Um, you can't just say 9999 today and then 9999 tomorrow. Right. Because that's what people try to do, right? So then is that the same case for, is it just a cash buyer? Yeah, you're supposed to. That's what, you see what I'm saying? You have to report it because it has to do with tax liabilities, tax reporting, tax report. They want to make sure that the money is legit. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying, yeah. okay. Okay, notes on earnest money. Notes on earnest money, it says here, occasionally buyer doesn't have any funds. So can we write an offer without a buyer check? Yes. Yes, right, it can be on goodwill. You don't have to have that dollar consideration. Well, yeah. It can be a goodwill consideration, right? Old earnest money for a new contract. What do we do with that, right? We have to transfer it, right? We have to transfer from one property to the next. So we can fill out a transfer form. It's We're supposed to give it back to the buyer. The buyer's supposed to write a new check. However, if the buyer agrees that we can transfer it, then we would just have them fill out the appropriate paperwork and transfer from one property to the next, right? But if it's under dispute, you have to put new funds in and hold those disputed funds on the side. Right? Blah, blah, blah. We're going to move on to the next. So we're talking about legal descriptions. When you have a contract, the legal description has to be put in there. Now, there's three acceptable legal descriptions, right? There's the address of the property. There's the actual legal lot block description of the property. And what's the third one? Parcel number, right? Those, one of the three has to be on the contract. And the definition of that says we have to be able to reasonably locate the property based on what is provided. Now, the good news is when we import everything and import the data from the tax records, it puts all three on there and we're usually covered, right? Purchase price, how are we paying this purchase price? How are we, finan are we financing? Is it cash? Is it VA? Is it USDA? Whatever the case is, we're putting these terms in there. Time limit for loan application, five days to apply, 30 days for loan approval, or whatever you're deciding to put. If it's a bond loan, you might go 40 or 45 days for approval. Is this gonna be owner occupied? Is this gonna be a second home? Is this gonna be investment property? These are important. 
because most loans make you move in within the 60 day period if it's owner occupied. And then is it conditional? Is it conditioned on we getting financing, right? Is this is one of our contingencies? There's a bunch of contingencies that can be contingent on sale of home, can be contingent on financing, can be contingent on appraisal, can be contingent on home inspection, can be contingent on you cleaning the house all the way up and getting rid of all the trash. It can be contingent on all kinds of stuff, right? We need to specify the cash sale. We need to specify if it's seller financing. We need to specify if it's FHA or whatever the case. When they talk about purchase money, they're talking about seller financing, right? And then we have all these different clauses in contracts and we have um, different types of loans, right? So these italics on page 299 talking about due on sale or assumable, is the contract assumable? Is the loan assumable? If the loan's assumable, we still have to, we still have to qualify for it. We can assume it and we can take responsibility for that through a process called novation. Novation will be assigning it over, right? Do on sale means if you sell it, we can't assume it, we have to buy it. We have to close and close that deal out, close that, that loan out and get a new loan, right? But you're only assuming the, the amount that's left. Correct, so, so anything else you have to get an additional loan or pay cash. Right. Right, right. What is a balloon payment? Balloon payments actually do come up on the state exam, I've seen this, right? So balloon payments are, okay, let's say I have a 20 year loan and the first 10 years is interest only and the next 20 years, the next 19 years, I'm gonna to have to pay this and on year 20, I'm gonna pay a lump sum of $50,000. That lump sum is considered a balloon payment. So we're at the types of financing up here. Right, and we're also gonna put loan clauses or mortgage clauses, MTG clauses. Right, those are, those are those are two pieces of this that could be tested, right? We're gonna talk about seller concessions and interest rates and all that stuff, right? When you get below 80% loan to value, sorry, when, you're, when you have more than 20% equity, you don't have to pay private mortgage insurance anymore, right? But if you have private mortgage insurance, it doesn't fall off until 78%. You can request it to fall off at 80%, but it will fall off automatically until 78% loan to value. And loan to value is what? It's price divided by loan. I'm sorry, it's loan amount over price, right? Loan amount over price. So whatever you're putting down payment wise, if you have a 300,000, sorry, $400,000 property and $300,000 loan, it's 300,000 divided by 400,000, 75% loan to value. No mortgage insurance, right, on that? VA loans can be zeroed down. So with an FHA or a VA loan, we have something called an FHA VA, a mandatory clause. And the mandatory clause usually says, or it says that the property must appraise. They're not gonna let you buy it without the appraisal. Not only does the buyer have to sign it, but the seller has to sign it as well. What is an adjustable rate loan? Adjustable rate loan is a loan that has a fixed period and then has an adjustment period and has an interest rate cap, right? So if we talk about ARMs, adjustable rate mortgage, the most common is a 525. Do you remember what the, the numbers stand for? Oh, um, the how the rate and the interval of which it can go up and then the max it can go up. All right, so this is the first one is the initial rate adjustment. So if your interest rate is 5% and you have a 525 arm and, and it's a 5-1 arm with a 525 interval, at year six, the interest rate could go up as high as 10%. If the rates are, and it has to be to market rate, not anything higher than market rate, right? So the rate, if the rate was 8%, it would go up 3% to 8%, right? The second adjustment is for the second and subsequent years, right? Second and subsequent years. So if the rate went up to 10 from eight, then it could go up 2% to eight, but it could also go down to six, right? And then the third one is the overall cap. So year seven, it goes up, 
to 10, and then rates go to 12, your eight, the rate could not go to 12 if they stay at 10 because five is the maximum that could go up. That's what, the, that's what those, those three numbers mean. Five one arm means the first fixed period is for five years and then every year afterwards it can adjust. Adjustable rate mortgages, we talked about that. Assumptions, you, we, you, you understand the concept because you told me, right? Um, what about chattel and fixtures? What, are, what is chattel? What is chattel? Chattel's like cattle, it's personal property. <laughs> How do I say chattel like cattle? It's personal property. So chattel would be these tables in this room, right? This whiteboard would be chattel, right? I could take it off the wall, take it with me, right? Is a dishwasher chattel? Yes, technically. It could be technically, yeah. but because it's gonna be fixed to the property in a certain manner and the intended use of the party, then it could be considered a fixture as well, right? Depends on Depends yeah. on. Like I would say, an oven is a fixture because most loans require there to be an oven. Correct. Correct. Right. But yeah. Okay. So unless it's unless it's stated, then you're assuming that the dishwasher stays. Right. But then, but, see, but it's in the contract now. It didn't used to be in the contract. Right. right. But like a washer and dryer. That's chattel. Right. But it could be a fixture depending on how you define it. Right. Contract. Okay. Right. So there's the ARMA test for that. Right. The method of attachment, right? The intended use of the part, intended use by the parties. The, it doesn't have anything to do with price, right? You can have a $10 light. But if they're married to it, right. then it's coming with it. Exactly, but it needs to be disclosed, right? right? This particular item doesn't convey. Yeah. If you put chattel and fixtures in the contract, you're subject to paying sales tax on that. So what most people do is, we're gonna include these items, but they're deemed to have no value, right? Because then you don't have to worry about it. Because you're paying sales tax on the house too. It's called deed stamps, right? You're paying taxes on it. Or you just add an amendment where it's off the contract, right? Or right, exactly. I don't know, what would you do? Well, uh, most people have some type of sign agreement so it's not within the loan. You know, I'll pay $2,000 outside of closing or whatever the case is. Because the, that doesn't have anything to do with the title. That doesn't have anything to do with closing. Right, we're going to have evidence of title. We're going to make sure that we have clear and marketable title. We have no additional liens that we have to worry about, anything like that. That's all going to be insured through title insurance. There's owner's title insurance and there's lender's title insurance. What's the difference between owner's and, title, owners and lender's title insurance? There's two major difference. One's for the buyer and one's for the, the lender. Right, so lender's title insurance covers the lender, okay? Owner's title insurance, and that's for the loan amount, right? Owner's title insurance covers, I like to say the equity, it protects the buyer, right? Protects your equity, it protects the buyer. Owner's title insurance is non-transferable. Lender's title insurance is transferable, why? Because lenders sell mortgages all the time. So they can transfer it from one to the other. Make sense? The other thing we do at closing, well, we're gonna specify a date and place of closing. A lot of people like to say 30 days after loan approval or 10 days after loan approval. The problem with that is that lenders usually work towards a closing date. So if you do that, you may have a delay in closing, right? A finite so date. Work towards a finite date when possible. There might be a situation where there's a outstanding judicial review needed for a probate or something, then you would say 10 days after this period, right? Yeah. That, that's one of the situations where you would use that. Most of the time I say work towards a specific date, see if you can close on time, right? Uh, you have time allowed for counters and offers and counter offer. All the times are, are put into the contract, date and place of closing. Where are we closing? Are we closing in an office? Are we getting a mobile notary? Is this a mail away, et cetera, right? Proration of expenses and income. Prorations are on what page of the closing statement? Three. Page three. Sorry. Page three, right? <laughs> Page three. Page two is what? Expenses, Expenses. right? Yeah. Okay, so, and again, we haven't gone over the closing statement yet, but that's it. Who's retaining possession of the property? Is there a tenant in place? Is there a lease that has an end date? Is the seller going to stay three days after closing or 15 days after closing? Is the buyer taking possession at closing, right? 
what type of deed are we delivering, the four types of deeds are what, general warranty deeds, uh, special warranty deed, bargain and sale deed, and quick claim deed. It's not quick claim deed, it's quick, quick claim deed. Right, we also have clauses within these things, right? They're called, they're different clauses. We have the covenant of season, right? The covenant of season says I've seized this property, I'm able to sell it, right? Habendum, habendum is associated with to have and to hold. These are the two most common ones that you see, right? Habendum clause, habendum and covenant of seasons. And, um, uh, habendum and S-E-I-S. It's Z-E-N, season, 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 season. It, it can be an S or a, a it depends on who writes it. It depends on who writes it. S or Z. Doesn't matter. Just understand what it is. Liquidated damages. What is a liquidated damage? Liquidated damage is the most common remedy when there's a breach in the contract, right? That's the binder. Right? Yeah, take the, the, the cash. Right? Yeah. right? Party who has been injured can sue, it's called a rescission on breach, right? Compensatory damages would be, you can, you can sue for additional damage if the earnest money is not sufficient. So, buyer closes on a house, or I'm sorry, buyer has a contract on a house, seller decides two days prior to closing that they're not closing anymore, right? Okay, well, they give them the $5,000 binder back, but now they've rented pods, they've got a moving company scheduled that they get charged for, they've got now canceled their lease, now they have to find a new apartment. Like, all these things could have happened, right? And it may not be covered by this $5,000, right? Well, the buyer shouldn't be responsible for that, so the seller or the buyer can sue the, the seller for compensatory damages, but they can also sue for this thing called specific performance because the seller didn't close, right? So if they sue for specific performance, they could force the seller to do the right thing and, and abide by the contract. There's been more specific performance lawsuits in the crazy market because people have been homeless, right? right. If you're going to be homeless, people are going to start suing more often, right? So be careful with that. We have these things called special assessments. What is a special assessment? It's a lien by some municipal authority saying, okay, I need to improve the sewer lines on the street. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to get paid by uh, a percentage of this fee split between the homeowners on the street, right? And the way it's done is, and this is really important because sometimes you see a calculation on this. Special assessment is based on two sides of the street. So if you need an assessment for a sidewalk and you have 50 linear feet and the seller across the street has 50 linear feet and it's charged $10 per linear foot or whatever, it's going to be split between you two 50-50, both sides of the street. Even if only one side of the street's getting it. Yeah, it's okay. going to be split 50-50, both sides of the street. Sewer line, same thing. It's going to be split 50-50. So always remember, if you see that, to divide the number by two to get the answer for the special assessment. All right. Uh, I can, we have a question we can work through if, if you want to do that down the road. Um, licensees acting as buyer or seller, you need to disclose. Condition on the buyer sell of property. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. We have to write something in there. Subject to financing, right? It says contingent on the sale of home or, or buyer's primary residence located at da 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 da. Don't just don't don't put contingent on sale of a home and the buyer owns 10 homes. What if one of them falls through? Mm -hmm. List the specific property address so that you cover yourself and not you don't have any issues, right? Property inspections is another contingency, right? Conditional upon spouse's approval, conditioned upon seeing the property, 
give me all these different contingencies or, or right. Now, what is a right of first refusal? Condo developments have right of first refusal sometimes. They're able to buy the property before you list it, right? A right of first refusal says this, and I call it a first right of refusal because that's what we've always called it in our board here. Uh, but a right of first refusal says, if I have a contingent sale on a house, the seller can decide, I want to put a right of refusal, or first right of refusal, 48 hour, 72 hour right of refusal on this. What happens is, if the seller decides to take the second offer, the first offer has a 48 hour right to push the property into pending, deposit additional earnest money, and forfeit that money if their other house doesn't close. If they decide, they can step aside and let offer number two take precedence. That's what a right of refusal is. Does that make sense? Okay. We don't use them very often. We used to use them a lot back in the early 2000s because a lot of contingent properties, we're going to start seeing more of that. Start seeing more of that. Um, of the crazy world, two years ago, we weren't seeing any because nobody was accepting contingent sales. But every time I see a contingent sale, I put a right of first refusal on it so that I make sure that we're covering the seller and looking in their best interest if we're working for the seller. I don't suggest it to the buyer. Right. <laughs> if it's uh, if I'm working for the buyer, I don't suggest it to the other seller. Right. But if I'm representing the seller, then I would suggest it to my seller. The law doesn't require contracts to be witnessed and signed, right? But if it's something that's of a long period of time, like a two-year lease, then it would have to be acknowledged. It would have to be witnessed, right? A listing agreement can't have what? An open-ended time. Right. So it can't be That's automatically right. renewing. It can't oh, have an yeah. open-ended yeah. time. Correct. Correct. So I have a question. The first right of refusal, like, that has to be done at the execution of the contract. Mm -hmm. Say you execute the contract and you accept everything as is, and then someone went home later that night and Googled something tomorrow and then the next morning your seller comes to you and says, oh wait, I want to do this first right of refusal Sorry, thing. it's already under contract. Okay, that's what. Sorry, it's already under contract. Okay. Now, if your person's nice, they could do that, but I wouldn't. Right. If I was working with the buyer. No, I'm just saying like that's time specific. That has to be executed at the same time as the, uh, as the buyer's offer. Right. So we talked about disclosures earlier of material defects and we talked about about HIV AIDS, we talked about, about people dying in properties. These properties, the term is stigmatized property, right? So if it's a stigmatized property, we don't disclose. Not in the state of Florida, other states require it, right? But not in the state of Florida. So if it's a stigmatized property, stay away from it, don't make a comment. And then we have to have an HOA disclosure, right? HOA disclosure must be given at the time of contract. The right, of refu the right to rescind starts from the time that they receive the HOA disclosure and they receive all the pertinent documents, including the frequently asked questions, right? And for resales, it's three days, right? And for new construction, it's 15 days. Is that right? Or is it the opposite? It says right here, if the disclosure summary has not been provided to a prospective purchaser before executing a contract sale, this contract is voidable by the buyer by delivering the seller or seller's agent written notice of the buyer's intention to cancel within three days of receipt. This is for resales, right? When so if you have you have the HOA disclosure that's given to you because it's part of the contract now, mm -hmm. so that's you can't you have to have that. But it is the buyers and the buyer's due diligence period to pull those HOA docs. It's not the sellers. Well, the seller should be providing them. The okay. seller should be providing them because the buyer is supposed to sign off that they receive these documents. So what happens in standard practice is nobody provides these documents. Right. People pull them. Well, what if the buyer didn't pull them until three days before closing? Right. Their clock doesn't start till they have the documents. So that's not on the buyer's side during their due diligence to pull those documents? Mm -hmm. The seller has to provide it. So I like to use the condo writer. The condo writer is more self-explanatory. The condo writer has two boxes. One says, buyer acknowledges in his receipt of documents, right? Check box. That's the one you want checked because that's the one that starts their clock ticking. The other one says, the buyer has not reviewed the contract documents yet. 
So if that's the case, and you don't provide it as a seller, then they can cancel all the way up until closing. Okay, so is it the buyer or is it title who's pulling the estoppel? Seller should be. Oh, no, the estoppel's different. Well, I know, but that's part of the HOA. Because they're, they're count. contacting the I know, I know that. But I'm saying, how, where is the seller supposed to get these HOA docs? From the actual CAM or the yeah. HOA? Mm -hmm. From the HOA or from the board or however okay. they get. Sometimes people have those big binders and they leave it at their house, right? If they leave it at their house for somebody to look at, then the buyer can potentially go look at this, right? But the three day clock starts and it's not the buyer's responsibility to get the documents, it's the seller's responsibility to provide those documents. Tax disclosure. Should or should we not rely on the taxes that are related to them, right? Energy efficiency, for sure. Transaction fees, they have to be done at the time. They have to be non-excessive. They, they cannot be charged to a VA buyer, right? We have community de development districts, right? Community development districts have to be disclosed, the prices. We also have to disclose if we can figure it out how many years we're left on a bond. Is there an O&M portion that is going to continue after? These are all things that we should be discussing with our buyers. Uh, if there's any building code violations or anything else. Then we have this other thing called a lease purchase or we have an option contract, right? Lease purchase binds the people to the sale, binds it to the purchase, right? Two separate documents to use a, a lease agreement and a sale purchase and sale agreement. This is a lease purchase. This is a lease purchase. This means I'm leasing it and I'm buying it. This is rent to own. That's what lease purchase is. Lease option is I'm leasing it for a specified period of time and I have the option to buy it at the end of the lease period, right? The difference between a lease purchase and a lease option is that the lease purchase is a bilateral contract and a lease option is a unilateral contract. Only the seller has to perform. Only the seller has to perform an option contract. If the market goes down and the agreed upon price is too high, the buyer does not have to buy the property on a lease option. On a lease purchase, they do. That can get sticky because on a lease purchase, if the market goes down, the buyer may not have the additional funds available to buy the house, right? Mm -hmm. So the lease option is more buyer friendly Right, the option E, the buyer, the option or the seller, right? Because the option or who's the option or has the obligation to sell if they are wanting to be executed by the buyer. The buyer has a choice. Buyer has a choice. So just know that option contracts are unilateral because that's, that's what's going to be asked. Right. Agreement for deed means contract for deed. Land contract or installment contract, we cannot prepare an agreement for deed because it's more like a mortgage, right? We can't prepare mortgages. Licensees can be disciplined for this and it's unauthorized practice of law. So stay away from that. I'm gonna see if there's anything else that we need to worry about. Uh, listing agreements have to be provided or purchase agreements within 24 hours. Talked about that. I'm trying to see if there's anything else on here. Doesn't look like it. We move on to the next section. The next section is talking about financing real estate. So we have the note and the mortgage. We talked about that already, right? We talked about the note is the actual promissory note. We promise to pay you back. You pay, you stay, you don't, you won't. The way you don't stay is if you don't pay and they exercise the mortgage right, 
right? The mortgage is the instrument used to convey the real property to the proper owner. And in the mortgage, we have these clauses. But before we do that, we have parties to the mortgage. Who is the mortgagor? The borrower. The borrower, right? <laughs> there's O's and borrower, there's O's and mortgagor, right? Who is the mortgagee? That's the lender, right? It has two E's, two E's. Never forget it because the lender doesn't have an O in it, right? We have a couple different clauses that might be in your mortgage. We have a prepayment clause which says, I'm allowed to pay it off early, okay? But then we have the opposite of that, and you might see a question on hint at prepayment penalty clause, right? Prepayment penalty clause. Prepayment penalty clause says if you pay it off early, then you are subject to some type of payment, payment penalty, right? It could be 3% loan amount, for example. Or, we have a due on sale clause, and we also have acceleration clause. What's the difference? Due on sale means if I sold the house, I have to pay Immediate. The mortgage in full, Immediate. right? It's due on sale, right? Due in full on sale. Acceleration clause says, I haven't made my payments, so I can now accelerate the, the mortgage to be, or the promissory note to be due in full, right? So they're both acceleration, but one's based on sale, one's based on missed payments, right? Be careful with the prepayment clause and the prepayment they'll trick you on the state exam and they'll try to interchange it so be careful with that one and we have title theory and lien theory right so florida is a lien theory state right you buy a house the lender puts a lien on the property and then you sign this mortgage and they can exercise their right based on acceleration if you don't make your payments to exercise the mortgage and get your property take over the title right then there's title theory state i like to say title theory state would be like the lender holding the title and then giving you the title after closing right lien theory means i don't have title i have lien theory means i have title right i have use of the property i have all that title theory means i don't have title but i have the equitable interest in the property right in georgia they're a title theory state in florida we're a lien theory state I like to use the car example because when you buy a car and you finance the titles with the bank, right? That's title theory. Lien theory is putting a lien on your property. What about foreclosure procedures? So again, we can, we can foreclose based on this acceleration clause and we can get that, right? So what about Subordinations. What is a subordination? Uh, if who's in line first to, to uh, that's right, right over the, yeah. And subordination, inferior and superior liens, inferior and superior liens are based on the date that they're done. Now, superior liens are things like property taxes, anything that can attach to the property, special assessments, it's specific to this property, right? Specific priority liens, right? Things that would be inferior liens would be IRS taxes, because that's against you and it can follow you to other places, right? Um, construction liens are specific, but they are inferior to the other liens, right? Mortgages, et cetera. If you have a mortgage that's not paid, if you have a mortgage that's not paid, then, and there's no property taxes paid, property taxes would be paid first, then the mortgage, right? If you had a pool that wasn't paid for, a construction lien would go after the mortgage if the date was after, and you would have the date after because you're not gonna do any work on a property, right, until then. The way it works for construction liens, though, is based on the day of commencement, the day that par the 
property starting off the day that it finished. So you have to be careful if you get an income tax lien after a construction lien, or I'm sorry, if you get an income tax lien before the construction lien, but after the commencement of the work. You have to know that the commencement of the work is actually when the time starts. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest one you have to worry about. And that's the one that they usually trick you on the test. Income tax lien on April 1st, construction lien on May 1st, but they started the work March 1st. That construction lien takes priority. What about foreclosures? So when you foreclose, they do this thing called they sell it on, a, on the market, right? They sell it on the courthouse steps, and then let's say you owe 150 and they get 100 for it. They can sue you for a deficiency judgment for the other 50,000, put a judgment on your credit, right? Now, back when Obama was president, they couldn't do that because they had waived it, Congress had waived it. But it could happen if you're getting foreclosed upon. You have the right to transfer or sign this mortgage, right? If it's an assumable loan. Uh, a junior lien holder would be something that is below after the first mortgage. So let's say you had a, so junior lien or inferior lien, uh, a home equity line of credit would be behind a first mortgage, right? It would be junior to that. It's also a junior lien in full. Um, if you have a home equity line of credit and you refinance your mortgage, remember it's done by date, the home equity line of credit will be here and the mortgage would be under it. Well, nobody's gonna allow that, so you're gonna have to get one of these subordinations, right? The lender has to agree to that. The term equity of redemption, what does that mean? Equity of redemption is, if I'm in foreclosure, if I have pending litigation with pendants against it, I have the right, up until the foreclosure sale, to redeem my property by catching all the payments up and all the applicable fees. I can redeem it until it's actually sold on courthouse steps. So if I'm behind $20,000, I can show up with $20,000 to get my property back, right? Even if somebody sells it. So that's where you have to be careful with these auctions is that even though you win the auction, you may not win the house, right? Because people can come and redeem it. And it does happen. But we dealt with that in Kentucky on one deal. Um, when I was up there. Okay, so we have these different types of mortgages. We have term mortgages and fully amortized mortgages, partially amortized mortgages. A partially amortized mortgage would be something that you make maybe interest only payments for part of it and then we make full payments towards the rest. A lot of equity lines are that way. You're making interest only payments for say 10 years of a 25 year home equity line and the last 15 years is a fixed rate amortized mortgage, right? We talked about adjustable rate mortgages. A graduated mortgage is the monthly payments in a loan's early years don't cover the accrued, the accrued interest. The unpaid interest is added to principal balance. Or another thing, another term for graduate payment is a, is a, is a negative amortization loan. You're actually losing principal because you're not covering up interest. Back in the day, we were doing those pay option arms, and they had a negative amortization payment option, and a lot of people that were flipping homes were using these and paying a very minimal amount of money. Reduction option mortgage says that if borrower or if interest rates decline, then we can refinance once if the rate is lower. So you're starting to see a few of those um, with new construction where when you sign a contract, they give you an option to reduce it. Re reduction option mortgage is somewhat like, we call it rate protection when I was in the loan industry, uh, where you could do a one-time float down to the, net, to the lower rate, right? I don't think you need to worry about the early payment mortgage. Um, early payment mortgage means I can just pay off early, right? So I can write, I can write an extra check once a year, pay it down however I wanna do it. These are common sense, 15 year mortgage, 3% down mortgage, I'm not worried about that. We will talk about buy downs, right? So what is a buy down? Buy down is, buy down is when you wanna buy your rate down, right? And what's the rule with buying down a rate? 
You have to make sense of the road. Well, so you're going to do a break-even analysis, and if it's less than five years, typically, because most people live in a house five years or less, then it would be worth it. If it takes more than five years to recoup the difference, then it's usually not worth it, right? So buy down is, what is a quarter percent equal to? Or, I'm sorry, what is an eighth of percent equal to? One point. So one point, one point equals an eighth of a percent. So two points is a quarter. Right, one point equals an eighth of a percent, but it also equals one percent of loan amount for cost. Hmm. Right? So a $200,000 loan at 4%, and you want it to be 3.75%, would be a quarter point, would be two points, and $200,000 loan, it would be $4,000 of upfront interest that you would pay. That's what the buy down will be. So we need to know that one point equals one eighth of a percent of interest rate, but one percent of the loan amount. And then eight points equals one percent of interest rate, or eight percent of loan amount. That's what we need to know about that for buy downs. What question you might see is a consumer bought a house at four hundred thousand dollars at four percent, but they paid four points to get to that four percent. What is the effective APR? What is the effective yield? The effective percent. yield will be half a percent higher or four and a half percent because you bought it down. So the question that I see a lot or we see on the state is that question exactly. All right, so we have to be careful with that. Purchase money mortgage is seller financing, right? Participation mortgage says the lender participates in the investment properties equity return or equity kicker. So they get a portion of equity. So if you make so much, or it might be a portion of sales or periodic appraisals, that they, they're going to get a piece of that equity, right? Participation mortgage. They're, they're participating in the risk. It's less risk to them because if it goes up, they get more money. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. A blanket mortgage, and then it talks about mortgage, uh, shared appreciation mortgages and mortgage, I've never seen any of that on the test. Um, but again, it has to do with getting extra payments because of maturity of, of the property or because of extra sales or et cetera, right? Um, this mortgage participation sounds similar. It says here they were using it to develop theme parks, right? A large project and the amount of money was too much right so then the lender will participate in the mortgage and get portion of proceeds down the road right uh, blanket mortgages is covering a bunch of lots so what a lot of a lot of developers like to do is they get this blanket mortgage over 20 lots and they want to do partial releases right they want to Okay, we develop two, we'll release those, we'll develop, and then we'll get five more, or whatever the case is. Uh, that's what a blanket mortgage is. You need to have the partial release clauses if you were the developer and you want to develop things at the most minimal cost. Right? Uh, reverse mortgages. So, how does a reverse mortgage work? A reverse mortgage is usually with an elderly person that has no heirs. They want to have extra living expenses, so what they do is they apply for this reverse mortgage, and let's say they're 70 years old, they get a 30-year reverse mortgage, the bank will pay them equal shares of payment as money to basically purchase the house, is what they're doing. Yeah. So they're purchasing it back, and the assumption is, is that the 70-year person will live to the average age of 81 or 82, so the bank will get the house after 10 years of payments, which is a win for the bank, but it's also a win for somebody who doesn't have any heirs because now they're living and using their money, right? So if they if they if you have heirs, you're screwing your your uh, your family, yeah. right? Um, so I would prefer to give an extra thousand dollars to whoever to get the property. Package mortgage, what's package mortgage? Package mortgage 
packages everything up. So let's say you're selling an Airbnb and you want to get all the furniture, that would be a package mortgage, right? Um, again, a lot of underwriters don't like that, so we stay away from it. Um, if you were going to do a package mortgage, then they would have a higher pay and higher interest rate typically because of the risk, right? Uh, home equity line we already talked about. Um, home equity line, when you talk about loan to value, they have this thing called combined loan to value. So you take A and B and add them together and divide by the purchase price, right? Back in the day, we were doing 80-20s. The first mortgage was 80%. The second was a 20% HELOC, right? That kept us from getting mortgage insurance, but the rate on this 20% was an adjustable rate mortgage, so you have to be careful. Uh, let's see here. We have conforming and non-conforming loans, and we have conventional and non-conventional loans, right? Conforming means I'm within the parameters set by the investor, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, whoever, right? We're conforming to their maximum loan amounts. That's what conforming means. Non-conforming loans means I'm getting a jumbo loan. I'm getting a portfolio loan. I'm getting something that's not invested by Fannie or Freddie, right? Conventional loan means I'm getting a loan that isn't government. Right, it's just a federal agent. It's it's backed by Fannie or Freddie. If it's a non or it's, if it's a non-conventional loan, we're talking about government loans, right? We're talking about FHA, VA. So don't confuse conventional with conforming. Two different okay. things, right? Yeah. Conforming has to do with loan amounts. Conventional has to do with is it financed VA or FHA or not, right? All right, so. That's not true in the book. I'm not gonna even go over that. It says general characteristics of interest rates, I better go over it. It says are a quarter quarter of a percent lower than FHA. That's not true. FHA has lower interest rates today, you know? But that was probably true at the time the book was written. Here's a payment factor table. You don't have to worry about that. If there's a question on that, they'll give you the payment factor, all right? Um, Private mortgage insurance, we talked about that already. Uh, let's see here. FHA insured mortgage. If they say something about FHA or a 203 loan, 203B is FHA, 203K is FHA rehab, right? Construction loan. When we talk about private mortgage insurance, we're typically referring to conventional loans. When we talk about mortgage insurance premium, we're talking about FHA. Mortgage insurance premium is paid like this. It's paid 1.75% up front, tacked onto the loan for an FHA deal, plus a 0 0.805 factor for the loan amount for the first period. Right, and then it can change as it goes lower than I think 0 0.02, okay? There's gonna be maximum loan amounts. Um, we're gonna talk about interest rates. Qualifying ratios. Then we talk about qualifying ratios. Qual qualifying ratios, we have two types of ratios. And for the test purposes, we have, we have PER and we have TOR. Right, her is housing expense ratio. It's the amount of the payment divided by your gross monthly income. Okay, amount of the house payment divided by your gross monthly income. Total obligations ratio is housing expenses plus credit cards, plus student loans, plus car payments, plus second homes, plus investment property divided by your gross income. Those ratios have to fall within certain limits, right? For FHA, the her tour ratio is 31 and 43. For conventional, it's 28 and 36. For VA, there's only one ratio, it's 41%. Total obligations ratio is 41%. Remember, these are textbook answers, this is not real life. Right? But for testing purposes, FHA 31, 43, it has to fall within both boxes to qualify. Conventional, 28 to 36, VA, 41, 
VA is very confusing because you can do a thing called a residual and you can get a higher ratio and see so you can close that way. Um, if you see something about automated underwriting systems, that's going to be the program that you put plug it into and it will give you an approve eligible or an LP accept, which will give you an automated underwriting approval. Sometimes it has to be manually underwritten to get the final answer, right? Let's see. We have rural housing. So rural housing is a USDA loan. Uh, there's 102% financing. That 2% is a guarantee fee that's rolled into a loan. On a VA deal, you have first use VA funding fee. It's called VAFF funding fee. VA funding fee is VA funding fee is 2.15% of loan amount and the second use is 3.3% of the loan amount is the funding fee. But the good news with VA is that you don't have private mortgage insurance. I'm just putting the ratios on the board. These are important. about CRV, contract for deed, installment sales contract. Um, again, that's contract for deed is used to buy vacant land. It's used to buy vacant home sites. It's, it's kind of like what you would do for a blanket mortgage. It's, it's similar, right? Because you're going to finance and make periodic payment. It's almost like you're doing like a construction of permanent loan. You're, you're paying only on the portion that you used, right? Um, Sale and leaseback. Sale and leaseback happens a lot with uh, investment property of model homes, right? So Dreamfinders Homes actually does a lot of sale leasebacks where they'll sell the model homes up front and then they'll do a two-year leaseback for the investor to get paid. Um, but that keeps them from having to sell that property when they're ready to move out of the neighborhood, right? They've already sold it. So the sales owner financing. And we're talking about the CFBP at this point, the CFBP is the Consumer Financial Protection or Protection Bureau, right? And that was done uh, by the Dodd Frank Act in 2010. We changed, we changed the way we look at loans. We went from the good faith estimate, right? We had a good faith estimate, and the initial truth in lending statement is now the loan estimate. Right? It was to reduce documentation and make things less confusing. Well, it didn't really make things less confusing. There's actually more paperwork now. But if, you, if the question asks, what is the loan estimate composed of? It is the initial truth in lending, and it's a good faith estimate. Right? If it is the closing disclosure, it's a final, final, the final truth in lending and the Alta. What else do we look at? We look at Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which is the same as Fair Housing with a few small changes. When we talk about Equal Credit Opportunity, there's three terms that come up. We talk about redlining, which is the big one, right? Redlining is when I'm charging a different area, different interest rates based on demographics, based on discriminating factors, right? Well, I don't like properties in the east side of town because they're distressed and I'm going to charge 10% interest there, but in a neighborhood with high income in Deerwood, I'm going to charge 6% interest, right? That's redlining. You're not allowed to do that, right? There's two other things that come up and this has to do with lending and also has to do with real estate sales. There's blockbusting and there's steering, right? Can you, do you know the difference between blockbusting and steering? Yeah, you steer a person away from a particular area. All right, so steering somebody into an area is steering, right? Steering, oh, well, a bunch of Asian people live in East Hampton, for example, right? That would be an example of 
or do people live there that are, I want to live in a neighborhood with a bunch of agents, so I'm going to move them in there, right? That's steering in, right? Oh, your properties are going to go down because, I'm going to use agents again just so I don't discriminate, right? Their, their values are going to go down because there's a bunch of agents living here. You need to hurry up and sell. That's blockbusting, right? We're moving them out, right? Steering's moving them in, blockbusting moving them out. We don't want to steer people. We don't want to discriminate based on the fresh corn or the fresh corn, familial status, right? Race, religion, color, national origin, right? Handicap status, familial status, all that good stuff, right? Sex this is the last one, right? The acronym is fresh corn, F R S H C R N, no vowels. All right, RESPA, RESPA, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. So we have ECOA. ECOA is race, color, religion, sex, national origin, marital status, age, and receipt of income from public assistance. Now, remember, there's a couple differences here, right? We don't have fresh corn, right? Because this is not, this is not fair housing. This is equal credit opportunity. What are the differences? Marital status, it's not familial status, it's marital status, right? Are we getting food stamps or Section 8 housing, right? Those things can't be, or could be, I'm getting Social Security income. Could be anything, right? Those things can't be discriminated against. In fact, Social Security income actually can help you because you can gross it up because of the tax about the, the way it's taxed. You can discriminate against credit worthiness, though. Right. So if you have bad credit, right. you don't have So it to. doesn't matter. Yeah. So if, if you have great credit but don't make a lot of money. If you don't have enough income, you can't qualify based on this. Right. But then ratios. if you make a lot of money but your credit's crap, they can say, hey, sorry, I don't care that you make a million dollars a year. Your credit right. is your not Your credit's not bad. Right. So your character's bad. You're most likely not going to pay. Right. Right. So you can decline it, so it doesn't Correct. matter. Okay. Correct. So ECOA is Regulation C. So if you see Reg C, it's ECOA. If you see Reg Z, that's Truth in Lending. Truth in Lending means that anytime we disclose an interest rate or some numbers, we have these things called triggering terms, we have to disclose the annual percentage rate. Annual percentage rate on a mortgage is different than annual percentage rate on a credit card. Annual percentage rate on a mortgage includes closing costs and other, other fees. Right, so the triggering terms are in figure 12.5. Just know that if there's numbers, it's typically a triggering term. So we have to disclose APR. If it's something that's very general, and I don't know if you noticed, but there's three here, bi-weekly terms, easy terms, no down payment, you don't have to disclose an APR. But if you say, I need a 700 credit score, or 4,000 down or 5% down, then you have a triggering term, you have to give an APR. So it always be in that small fine print the really fast uh, auctioneer talk at the end of the commercial, right? RESPA says we have to disclose anything that's going on financially and transactional parties. RESPA says we're not allowed to give too many things to we're not allowed to give too much money back in a transaction without disclosing it, right? We have to disclose it. We can't just say, okay, if you use this, if you use this title company, I get a kickback. We can't do any of that. This is a violation of RESPA. RESPA is Regulation X. We don't talk about home to us, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, talks about the three-page loan estimate combining the two documents, the TILA, the Truth and Lending Disclosure, and that's the initial two lending disclosure, truth in lending disclosure, and the good faith estimate, which we already talked about. So we have RESPA, we have, we have RESPA, and we have TILA, and we have ECOA. So we need to know those pieces of lending. We probably only get like one question on that, but it's always good to know. Have a loan estimate. An affiliated business agreement has to be given if there is an affiliated business, right? Uh, disclosures before settlement. Closing disclosure is a combination of the HUD-1, or I call it the ALTA, the HUD-1 settlement statement and the truth and lending disclosure. We talked about that. That's the final truth and lending disclosure, not the initial. Um, 
Sometimes you have to give a uh, disclosure after closing, so like an escrow disclosure once a year when we do an escrow analysis. Uh, limits on escrow accounts, you can't have more than so much cushion in each account. Normally it's like two months or it says one twelfth. It's one twelfth of the total disbursement or one sixth of the total disbursements for the year. So you can't have more than two months, right? One sixth would be two months, right? Lenders must return excess money over $50. So if you have $5,000 overage, they could in theory just give you $49.50 back and keep the extra 50 as a cushion. Uh, RESPA prohibits certain practices for kickbacks. We just mentioned that, so worry about that. Let's see here. Talk about mortgage borrow analysis. So borrowers are analyzed by three things. There's actually four C's but we're gonna break them up differently. I like to call it the CIAC. So CIA is credit, income, assets, and collateral, right? Credit would be your credit reports, income would be your gross income monthly, assets would be how much money you have in the bank, or sometimes they call that cash, right? Credit's called character. Credit, income, assets. Income's called capacity, these are the C's of the four C's. So the four C's are character, capacity, cash, and collateral, right? Those are your four C's of lending. I like to say credit and income assets and collateral. Collateral is the property piece. When they look at the underwriting submission, it's based on CIA for the borrower and then the property is analyzed separately. How is the property analyzed? It's analyzed by appraisal, which we talked about earlier, right? Stability of income, income expense ratios, we talked about back here. Stability of income means I have two years history and three years continuance, right? How can we guarantee this continuance? We don't, but we do this thing called a verbal verification of employment, and it says probability of continued appointment is excellent, good, or they're letting me go in two weeks. Well, if they're letting me go in two weeks, they're gonna deny your loan because now you don't have stability of income, right? Flood insurance, maximum flood insurance is $250,000 under the FEMA rules. You know about income and interest rates and discount points. Yield. So do you want to go for a private insurance company, I guess, for flood? Or can you? Um, uh, 250 is the maximum insured value, so then you don't have to have everything else for other stuff, uh -huh. right? If it's a condo, it's actually $250,000 per unit. Mm -hmm. Let's skip all that. I already mentioned automated underwriting, so we're going to skip all that. That's unit 12. Unit 13 is our favorite part. It's closing real estate transactions. When we go under contract, we have to put the property into a contingency or a pending status, right? We have to deposit the binder with how many business days if we're a broker? Three. Three business days. Three business days, day one starts the day after the receipt of the binder. Day, the day you receive the binder in hand is day zero. And that doesn't have to coincide with the days on the contract. Correct. So if it says three days binder. And you receive it on day one, that's day zero. Yeah. And you have to start right then, right? right? It's the day you actually receive it in hand. Uh, delivered require your yeah, condo documents again we talked about that if you if you don't get the documents you can cancel all the way up until closing with a three-day right of rescission or 15 days if it's a new construction uh, deal we talked about all these different contingencies I'm going to skip all this uh, as far as WDO and all that you know what all that is mm -hmm. um, true or false pre-closing inspection should be done by the real estate agent false False, it should be done by the buyer. If it's not done by the buyer and you're the real estate agent, video it, right? Take pictures, video it, make sure that you are covering yourself because you don't want to be responsible for that. Closing papers reviewed by the buyer or seller one day before closing, and that never happens. But it should happen, right? Buyer's given the money for close, the amount for closing. 
you know the purchase and sale process. I don't really need to go through that with you. What you need to know is a couple things. Under FERPTA, the Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act, if you're not a U.S. citizen or you're not a resident alien with no social security number, you have to withhold 15%. The buyer, the seller has to, we have to withhold 15% to make sure the taxes are paid, right? Now that doesn't, ex that, a personal residence is exempt up to $300,000. So if it's less than that, you don't have to worry about it. Right, if you sell your property, and you're married, you get up to a $500,000 exemption. If you're single, you get up to $250,000 exemption. But that $250,000 exemption can be prorated. If you live in a property only a year, you can get $125,000 tax free. As long as you haven't sold another one in the past three years, right? Prorations, uh, again, the buyer, the, the the test is going to specify if it's the day of seller or the day of the buyer for closing. Be aware of that, prorate it, and look at who owns what piece and count the days accordingly. We do it on our knuckles, right? January, February, March, April, and that way you never miss a day. How many months have 28 days? One. All of them. Well, okay. <laughs> so we have to make sure, again, it's trick questions, right? Right. That's the stuff we have to worry about. Okay, so next thing. We're gonna talk about parations. Parations are on page three. Other things are on page two, right? All the expenses are on page two. So when the questions are asked, it's gonna say so much dollar credit buyer, debit seller, credit seller, debit buyer, whatever it is, what page is it on? That's how the test is gonna be written. We just need to know that expenses are on page two and everything else is on page three, right? But expenses are also on page three, right? Because it's a summary, right? Mm -hmm. A loan amount is a credit to the debt, credit to the buyer, or a debit to the seller. Or is it a credit to the seller, or is it a debit to the buyer, or is it a credit to the buyer, or is it the a loan amount is a credit to the buyer, right? right? Because purchase price is debit. Right. Correct, yeah. Purchase price to credit to the seller. Credit to the seller, right? yeah. So you have to make sure you know where these are. Where are they on? Where are they at? They're on page three, right? Because that's the summary of the expenses. Or not, I'm sorry, the summary of the transaction. The summary of expenses would be on page two. <laughs> so appraisal cost, debit to the buyer is on page two, right? There's these case studies in here. We can go over one later. And then the binder would be on page two of the credit to the buyer. Credit to the buyer because they already paid it. Right. Right. But it wouldn't be a debit to the seller. It would just be a credit to the buyer. Right. So the, the question will say debit, debit seller, credit buyer, or we'll say credit buyer only. And what page is it on? Right. Right. Closing disclosure. That's it for unit 13. The last part, and what we can go over a closing statement separately if we need to. I've got five examples on YouTube as well. Um, federal income tax laws affecting real estate. This is the last piece, right? We're talking about tax treatment for real estate property taxes. We're talking about how much we can write off, and there was some discrepancy. It used to be a million dollars, now it's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? We can write the interest up up to that up to that amount, right? Prior to December 17, 2017, prior to December 15, 2017, a million dollars in debt qualified for the interest deduction, but now it's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. All right, you can deduct ad valorem taxes up to $10,000 on principal residence and second homes. Home equity lines, interest on home equity lines are no longer deductible unless the debt is used to buy, build, or substantially improve property. So what a lot of people were doing were they getting equity lines and buying their car and using that as a tax write-off. You can't do that anymore. You have to document that you did a remodel on your house, right? Mm -hmm. 
I already talked about reverse mortgages, or I talked about that, prepayment penalties, or I talked about that. Vacation homes. Vacation homes, you can deduct the interest on second homes, provided that it's rented less than 15 days in a year, right? We talked about that too, right? But if you rent it for six months while you're not there, you can't write off the property taxes because now you have a depreciable expense, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Home office, you can write it off if you don't have a place of business. So for example, me, I can't write off a home office because I have a place of business, right? I have to write off the place of business. Low income housing says the tax credit is 100% deductible, direct reduction of taxes, three times the tax deduction. Here's, there, there's an example in there, you're not gonna get tested on that. Uh, sale of principal West residence, we already talked about 250 and 500, but that can be prorated. Just remember that can be prorated. Um, if you have to sell within, for a change of employment, then you could qualify for additional exemption here. It says temporary regulations provide that a home will sell considered, home sale will be considered to change employment if it qualifies persons resident at least 50 miles away than from the employment. Hmm. When you die, when somebody dies, the value of the inherited property is based on the date of death. So if you inherit the property, what a lot of people ask for is I need a comparative market analysis for the six months prior to January 1st, 2018. So you do that market analysis for there so that you get the value at the time of death and then you would get the value, current value, and that would be what's taxed, right? That would be your basis, right? So. It's important when you're doing probate deals or when you're doing deals when somebody passed away that you assess it properly so that you can provide it to an accountant or an attorney or whoever needs to get it that so they can report the proper amount of taxes. My favorite investment thing, here we go, PGI minus vacancy and collection losses plus any other income like interest, right, would be your effective gross income minus your operating expenses equals your net operating income. We talked about that up there somewhere. PGI right here, right? We have to minus our debt service, our annual debt service would be our mortgage payments for the year, right? That would equal your, so we take NOI, we minus your annual debt service, and we get before tax cash flow, plus or minus your income taxes, right? Do you get a credit or a debit on your income taxes? Most of the time it's a debit, and then you would get your after tax cash flow, right? That's your income property financial statement. If you think about it logically, the only piece you're adding on to the NOI is your annual debt service, right? Your annual debt service is your payments for the year. Why is it for the year? It's because we're calculating income taxes for the year, right? So it has to be for the year, right? Net operating income plus reserves for replacement, less interest depreciation amortization is going to be your taxable income. So they're going to use this figure 14.6 to calculate what your, your tax rate is going to be for your, your before tax or your uh, income taxes here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times on the questions on the test, they're going to give you the majority of it, right? And you're just going to figure out one piece of it. Uh, allocation costs. So this is this is important, right? For depreciation, we need to make sure that we're adding and subtracting the right expenses, right? So fourteen point seven is really good for depreciation purpose. Remember, we we talk about this term basis. The basis is what we're using to depreciate, right? We don't have a land value, but we do have other prices. We do have other things to use. So broker commission, closing costs, etc., could be added to. The purchase price of property depreciated. Does that make sense? So Janice buys an office building for four hundred thousand. She pays two thousand for the appraisal, seven hundred for the survey, nine hundred for the broker or nine thousand for the broker commission, 
1800 for title insurance, you would add all those to that 400,000. And you would get 413,500. Now, because the building's only worth 80% of the property value and the land is worth 20% of the property value, then you would take that number that you received after you added all the expenses and multiply that by 80%. And you would get, in this case, Yeah, I, think I messed up on that, but now I have to add everything before to add I get all, the, then, yeah. and, But you have to know the ratio of land to building value. That's what that is. You could see a question on that. Um, so you're active and passive and non-passive income. I mean, non-passive income is active income. It's like selling procedures, right? Passive income will be something you're getting residually. Well, okay, yeah. right. Uh, I don't need to worry about that. We're almost done here. Installment sale is going to give you an advantage because you're only getting a piece of the pie, right? Tax tax reasons, right? You're only getting, you're paying taxes on a lower amount over a longer period of time, right? So the income tax rate would be lower. As far as capital gains and capital losses, it's important because you can offset gains from active income, right? You, or you can offset your losses against your active. So let's say you lost $15,000 and you had income of $15,000, you could offset those and it would be zero, right? If it was passive income, you couldn't. You could pass off $3,000 a year for five years because you can do a maximum of capital loss of $3,000 against any other income. Make sense? Mm -hmm. 1031 exchange. The thing you need to know about 1031 exchange is deferred taxes on investment property. You sell and you buy like-kind property. Like-kind property, you sell, you identify a new property in 45 days and you close in 180 days and you can do a deferred exchange to where the equity is put to the next property. It has to be a higher amount for the property. You can't buy a $200,000 house, sell it for $300,000, and buy another house for $150,000 to do that just for exchange, you have to have more invested. So if I sell a property for $900,000, as long as I spend all of it, I can buy three other houses. I think you can. You okay. just have to, we just have to, we just have to run that through this qualified intermediary to make sure that it okay. works. No, I was just, okay. Right. So it's hard to, I'm not gonna be able to answer that question unless, okay. unless we actually, do that. And I think that's it for 14. That's it for chapter or part three.